Welcome everybody. I'm so glad that you've come to join us today. And we are going to uh, share a lot of wonderful things with you today. I'm Sarah Bunin Benor, founding director of the Jewish Language Project, a unit of Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion. The mission of the Jewish Language Project is to promote research on, awareness about, and engagement surrounding the many languages spoken and written by Jews throughout history and around the world. And we do this through several initiatives. We've been recording speakers of endangered languages, especially Iranian Jewish languages, like Judeo Hamadani and Judeo Shirazi. We've been translating those videos and creating dictionaries. Twice a week, we post fun facts about Jewish languages on social media, and we sell merchandise like posters, tote bags, and apparel, which are raising awareness about Jewish languages in Jewish educational settings and beyond. And we offer online events like the one you've come to today. You can learn more about all this and subscribe to our email list at jewishlanguages.org. And on that site, you'll also find several exhibits including on Passover, the High Holidays, and liturgy. And our most recent addition is the exhibit that we are pleased to launch today, A Millennium of Jewish Women's Voices. This exhibit has been in the wor works for about a year, and I'm pleased to introduce Abby Graham, the curator of the exhibit, to tell you more about it. Abby is a linguist and teacher focusing on indigenous and heritage language revitalization. She received her BA from the University of Pennsylvania and she's currently studying Yiddish. She started volunteering for us at the Jewish Language Project about a year ago and she's done so much great work designing fun facts, editing videos and helping with language documentation. And the amount of work that she did for this exhibit was just massive. So Abby, please tell us about the exhibit. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so yeah, we've been working on this exhibit for quite a while now. Um, and when we started working on it, there were two things that we really wanted to make sure that we were representing, um, right? Diverse Jewish languages, which is the mission of the Jewish Language Project, but also women's contributions to the Jewish record. Um, most well-known Jewish writings are by men, um, and especially really broad English-speaking audience, maybe we'll have Hebrew, Yiddish, maybe Ladino, as the only Jewish languages that maybe people have ever heard of. Um, so there are books, there are archives, there are online resources that focus on women's writings and songs, but we wanted to create an interactive platform that also highlighted languages. Um, and what's really exciting about this map is the ability to, to have all of that information and to visual, visualize all of the materials um, on this interactive space. So we've compiled more than 80 pieces in 20 languages um, over more than a millennium, as you can tell from our name. Um, and if you were here right at the beginning, you got to see a couple of those in the slideshow, but I'm gonna go ahead and share a couple of them um, in a little bit more depth before we get started. So the earliest surviving documents, can everybody see this? Thumbs up, great. Um, the earliest surviving documents in the exhibit are mostly letters. And they tell us a lot about women's lives at the time. So this one is from the 12th century in Judeo-Arabic, which in this case means the language is Arabic and it's written using Hebrew letters. Um, and it's from Miriam, the sister of Maimonides. Uh, and her son was studying in Cairo at the time and she hadn't heard from him in a while. So she reaches out to her brother to say like, hey, where is he? Like, can you follow up? Give him a piece of my mind. Um, and it's, you know, it's kind of fun because folks are coming up against the same thing that we are today. Why are my kids not responding to me? They have divorce problems, they have issues in the workplace. Um, so it's really relatable. Um, and then some of the material is actually written by men for women's use. Um, so Sudurim um, and other religious material that were translated into the vernacular would have been more accessible for women who didn't necessarily speak Hebrew. 
Um, and it wasn't always just the words that were translated. Uh, in this, there's a morning blessing, a traditional morning blessing that usually gives thanks to God who did not make me a woman. Um, and in this Ladino version from, from Venice in the 1400s, it says, the thanks to God who created me according to his will, which is really um, similar to the translation that people use today for this prayer. Other times people were dictating to scribes who were male. Um, and so this is a really interesting thing is that sometimes the women still considered themselves really the authors of them. So they th say things like, um, I'm writing you to you from whatever location. Um, it kind of like blurs the lines of what we think about authorship um, and writing. And that analysis comes from Oded Singer and then also from Renee, who you'll hear from a little bit later. Um, skip that one. <laughs> um, when we started working on the exhibit, we were really focusing on written documents. Um, but there are a lot of women's songs across Jewish cultures and languages. And these are really important ways that we've passed our voices down from generation to generation. So this notebook is filled with lyrics of Jewish Malayalam women's songs. Um, and these were handwritten books that would be passed around the community in Kochi in India, where they're from. Um, and women would learn the songs orally from each other, but also through the written lyrics. This one is from around 1900, and there are a couple dozen like it. The tunes have like largely been forgotten as people have stopped singing these songs um, as the community moved to Israel. But um, a group of women produced an album. There's a little bit of static. I don't know if you, it's your microphone or. To, mm. you know, it just comes and goes. So just be careful not to touch your computer or microphone or whatever. All right. <laughs> Um, so they created an album of some of the songs um, in 2004 uh, called Oh Lovely Parrot. So um, this work is really personal work. Um, sorry, jumping back here. So people are using these songs that maybe haven't been sung in their family or maybe have been, but are starting to stop be spoken. Um, and the, these song notebooks are kind of rare in that the women were writing them down at the same time they were singing the songs. More often, songs have been passed down orally, and then they're not recorded until language activists or researchers document them, um, which doesn't make them less legitimate, but a little bit less legible for us. So when we go to put the songs on the map, we come across this issue of um, we're dating them on the map at the year that they're recorded, uh, even though they're probably decades, if not hundreds of years older than that. Um, so even kind of accidentally, we're sometimes privileging certain kinds of documentation. Um, but yeah, this is really, really personal work. We're doing a lot of academic um, stuff. We're spending a lot of time in archivists. But um, a lot of the contemporary work is focused on revitalizing languages and cultural practices or document documentation. Um, so here on the right, there is a trilingual Jewish Neo-Aramaic dictionary with English and Farsi. Um, Shanaz, who I believe is on this call, started this work in her hometown in Kurdistan, continued it in Tehran, and then to LA, where she lives now. Um, on the other side is also a dictionary, an etymological dictionary in Juhudi, which is the language of the mountain Jews of Azerbaijan and Dagestan. And um, the woman who wrote it is also the one of the organizers of a language collective um, made up primarily by women. So this work, even the academic and research parts, um, you come across a lot of intergenerational things and in a lot of ways, very living practices. Um, there are really a huge number of people without whom this would not be possible, including the panelists who you see right now. Um, and I just really um, am excited that this launch is here um, and, and how many people's hands have been in it. So I just talked a lot about the exhibit but I want to share a little bit of what that looks like, as well as a little tutorial on how to use that. So um, let me get that shared. Can everybody go to my screen? Yes. Okay. Great. Hey, so here we are on our exhibit map. Oh, we lost the sound. It, we heard it at the beginning, but then not what um, when you start to browse the map, make sure you go over here and click this little down arrow, and that will give you a little bit more space to navigate on your screen. So each of these colorful dots on the map represents an item in the exhibit, and they're color coded by era. So when you look down 
at the timeline on the bottom of the screen, um, you'll see that there are brown, orange, and then you get into uh, purple and green over here. And these all correspond to different times. So to look up close at any of the items, um, you just go ahead, mouse over it, and then click. Um, and that will zoom you in to the item itself. You'll see the title, where it's from, and when it is, um, a set of hashtags, and then a short description here. And for songs, there will be audio for some of them that you can go ahead and click play on. If you click on the image up at the top, it will zoom in. And some entries have more than one image. Some will only have one. And if they do, you'll have little arrows to go back and forth here. So to take yourself back to the main screen, you can just click this X. You can zoom out. But let's go back in and take a look a little closer at that entry. So one of the best ways to navigate around the exhibit is using these hashtags that are here. So this is a henna song that's for a wedding and it's in Baghdadi Judeo-Arabic. So I might click the wedding hashtag and this will take me and it will show me all of the entries in the exhibit that have to do with weddings. So I'm gonna click on this over here. Now in this location in Bukhara, there are two different items that are here. Um, one is from 2019 and one is from 1978, and they're actually both having to do with weddings. So I'll click on this one. Um, and again, I have my title and the description of it. And this is a video, so I can click on the video and then click play here. <laughs> bring you back to everything here. So when you want to browse by places or by tags, you'll click this little three bars over on the left side, and you can click tags and scroll through everything that's here. So these are organized by genre and by language, um, and occasionally by source also. So we have some in Hebrew, there's Aramaic, there's Arab, Judeo-Arabic, um, and then you can also look at the different places that are here. Um, and most places will only have one item, but some have two or even four. Um, if you want to take yourself back to the timeline, you can make sure you navigate back to this and you'll have your timeline pop up again here. We really hope that you enjoy this exhibit and have a fun time browsing all of the great material that's here. All right, sorry for that text snafu at the beginning. Um, but that is our exhibit. We are so, so excited to be presenting it here. Um, and that if you need any help navigating through it, that's up and available on our YouTube page as well. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I also just posted in the chat a link to the exhibit itself so that later after our event today, you can browse and enjoy. There's so much that we can learn from this exhibit about Jewish women, languages, and history. And to help us with that, we're now going to turn to our panelists, four scholars of Jewish women's history and literature, Hila Cohen, Renee Levine Milamed, Federica Francesconi, and Laura Arnold Liebman. And these experts are going to help us understand the context and implications of the texts in the collection. Uh, our event that's coming up in two weeks will focus on the songs, so we're not going to focus on that today. So I'm now going to introduce Hila. Hila Cohen is a translator and literary scholar. She has studied Juhuri literature under theater director Eva Shalver and poet Batsion Abramova. Together with cultural activist Valeria Nachshan, Hila, Hila works to increase access to the Juhuri language among English-speaking Kavkazi Jews. Her other projects connect the histories of Turkish, Hebrew, Juhuri, and Russian. Hila is a PhD student in comparative literature and a Falk Fellow in Jewish Studies at the University of Pennsylvania and a visiting student at Bojazici, I'm not sure how to say that, uh, University in Istanbul. 
So Hila, please uh, tell us what you noticed about the exhibit. Well, um, first of all, there's this huge sense of gratitude that comes with the ability to see um, representations of so many human experiences across time, space, and language in one place. Like that in itself is, is just profound. And in paging through the different texts, songs, and items that are curated in, in the exhibit, um, I was thinking about something that you mentioned earlier, Abby, which is um, rethinking authorship. So as an Ashkenazi Jew myself, someone who's coming from literary studies, who's accustomed to thinking of people of the book in a written sense, um, it was really special to see, for example, a, an amulet written in Ladino from Cochin, India, that was used for protection during pregnancy. Like when you ask about um, this item or encounter it, it's not about um, you know who wrote what idea on paper in order to transfer it to a particular audience. It's about what words, what verbal creativity does within a community, um, what it does for people, how they relate to gender within that context. And so um, when I was thinking also about Juhuri language activism today, literary activism today, I started seeing um, what Juhuri women are doing in a new light. So um, one of the items that is featured in the exhibit is a, an animated short film by Shoshana Yusufova. Um, and it's a fantastic piece about the tradition of Nilinanam or lullabies in Juhudi. Um, and looking at the items in the exhibit um, and all of the songs and traditions coming together as words that are being creative in a community where the creation of a, a song, an amulet, a record of membership in a group um, is itself bringing people together. I started thinking about how Shoshana Yusufov's work involved bringing her mother, Frida Yusufova, whose etymological dictionary you showed, uh, bringing together um, translators, bringing in a Kemanche player, um, Sergei Ilyasafov, a famous composer and singer, um, in order to create the different components of an animated piece that expresses the vision of a woman, but also is bringing together two generations within the community um, and creating this essential bridge to bring a language forward into the future in a new medium, so an animated film. Um, and that was a, a theme that I saw repeated throughout um, a number of pieces in the exhibit. So. Um, moments when translation, transmission, the creation of an object, um, retranscription, these acts of authorship and agency are themselves bringing people together. Thank you very much, Hila. Uh, and just to answer a question that somebody had, uh, Juhuri is the language spoken by Kavkazi Jews, Jews in the, in the Eastern Caucasus region, like Azerbaijan and Dagestan. And it's a, a, a in, the, in the Persian language family. Now we turn to Renee Levine Melamed, who is a professor of Jewish history at the Schechter Institute in Jerusalem. She researches the lives of conversos, Sephardi and Oriental Jewish women, Salonican Jewry, and women's lives as reflected in the Cairo Geniza. Among her published books are Heretics or Daughters of Israel, the Crypto-Jewish Women of Castile, A Question of Identity, Iberian Conversos in Historical Perspectives, and An Ode to Salonika, the Ladino Verses of Buena Sarfati. She is the academic editor of Nashim. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Um, I, I've, I'm looking at this as an historian, as someone who started uh, the first time I, I taught a course where I was supposed to be teaching about Jewish women, uh, my, I, this, my hair turned white very young, so this doesn't mean that I'm quite 120 yet, but um, it was really, really hard to put together a course. Uh, we started with the Bible. I mean, that was, you know, out of desperation kind of thing. Uh, and there were, everybody knew about Dona Grazia, and there were a few outstanding women there, but it was this was pre-Jewish Women in Historical Perspective by Judith Baskin, the first the first edition, uh, and it was it was really tough. I mean, I sometimes felt like I was fudging it. And as the years went by, uh, there were more and more discoveries. I mean, even when you, uh, Abby showed Miriam the letter, Miriam there. Uh, the, the truth is, is that when my colleague Joel Kramer, who was a great Geniza scholar, um, when he saw that, when he was sitting in Cambridge and saw that, that's what made him start looking into women's letters uh, and, and, and get, getting into that. 
and got me, pulled me into it, you know, as a result. Um, I think it was a lovely experience to see the panel, uh, to see the geographic uh, movement uh, and, and the, uh, the vast amount of material that has was being accumulated. I know this is just sort of a drop in the bucket. Uh, I, I, I also, I mean, <laughs> I've been going through files in my office and I also have you can see from year to year when I found more material and more material and, and, and about whether it be women in Spain, because that was what I was supposed to write for the Jewish Women Historical Perspective. And when I told Judith Baskin, there's nothing, I cannot go into the archives for 50 years and write you an article. Um, so it is, it's, it's, it's a really, it's a wonderful project. I think it gives one of a, a great perspective that the women were out there, they were doing, we knew they were doing things, but we, it was hard to prove it sometimes. Uh, and I think that this is sort of, this is a living proof for me as a medievalist, the older it is, the better it is because that's something more special and, and more difficult and more difficult to pinpoint. Uh, but uh, I think that that was basically my, my impression was looking at it and say, oh, I teach this, I do this one, I've done this document. Oh, I know this one, I know that one. Oh, I've heard of that because I also happen to have the name Malamed is Ma'alam, we have some Oriental family uh, in, in, here in the Yemenite world uh, and, and touching on it. And, and uh, I, I say bravo for the project. Thank you, Renee. Now we turn to Federica Francesconi. She's Associate Professor of History and Director of the Jewish Studies Program at the University of Al Albany, SUNY. She had two books published in 2021, both of which won several awards. Invisible Enlighteners, the Jewish merchants of Modena from the Renaissance to the Emancipation, and her co-edited volume, Jewish Women's History from Antiquity to the Present, which was central in the creation of this exhibit. And she's also currently at work on a new monograph provisionally titled The Jewish Home in Early Modern Venice, Cosmopolitan Intimacy, Global Networks, and Diasporic Material Culture. Federica. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Habi, for inviting me and for uh, making me a member of this uh, broad uh, community of scholars. Um, I, um, I, I've been uh, uh, really interested in this exhibit, and I really enjoy the breadth of the map and the text, and I think that is really also a it's a reflection of how scholarship on Jewish women and uh, text related to women and text related to gender has been shaped in the last 20 years. And uh, in, a, a, in the volume on uh, Jewish, women is, um, Jewish women history from antiquity to the present, I had the privilege to work with uh, Rene and I was a sort of a continuous dialogue, uh, thinking about how the, the field has been shaped and what kind of sources we have. And as Rene mentioned, and as the exhibit shows, now we cannot anymore pretend that there are no sources about women or written by women. Here, what I think that I see even more is also the possibility of bringing also some conclusion and, and making some reflections about some trends about the Jewish women writings that went that also go beyond the what we mean by writing in the modern experience. So what for me was very interesting, for example, looking at the 17th, the 1600 and the, the plethora of Abby, uh, uh, the plethora of texts that Abby co collected, I've been so interested and in a way from a nursing woman from Yemen and a letter from Ashnat Barzani in Mosul, Iraq, a will uh, dictated by a Levantine Jewish woman um, to a, a notary in Venice, or texts such as uh, Tchines, uh, a, a published in Yiddish, say that Tchines in 1648, or Senarene uh, in uh, Poland, published in Poland in 1622, or just to go back to Rene's work, a prayer by a crypto Jewish woman in Belamonte in 1600. So for me, what here is interesting uh, is uh, thinking about uh, First of all, this kind of culture of writing has been defined by Deborah Kaplan and Elisheva Karlebach in terms of 
an explosion and a continuation of cultural writing after the mid 15th century. And here we see really a sort of global perspective. More also the idea of how what we mean by writing here, as some others already uh, um, suggested, Hila and, and also um, René, as well as Abby, here what we have is also the classic act of writing, the class of, or for example, how is writing an operation also of collaboration? So you are dictating something to a notary or you are stitching on, an, on a textile or you are, delivering a testimony and somebody is recording your testimony, but you as a woman, there is always an agency. And finally, what I was thinking also the idea of going through um, a, a synchronic and diachronic process. And here, for example, um, Abby mentioned the text and the prayer in the morning. Thank you, God, for not making me a, a, a woman. And thank you, God, for making me according to your will. And if you go to 15th century, 1471 and 1480, you see actually collaboration by from uh, between a rabbi, rabbi uh, uh, Abraham uh, Farisol in Ferrara and Mantua, and uh, some women who actually they wanted having this rabbi writing, thank you, God, for not making me a man. On these words, I, I conclude what I think is a good kind of um, way to think about different ways of writing and how the concept of writing could be uh, expanded uh, also in theoretical from a theoretical point of view, thanks to this exhibit. Thank you again. Thank you, Federica. And now we turn to Laura Arnold Liebman. Laura is professor of English and Humanities at Reed College, vice president of program for the Association for Jewish Studies and the author of The Art of the Jewish Family, A History of Women in Early New York in Five Objects which won three, nas three National Jewish Book Awards. Her latest book, Once We Were Slaves from 2021, is about an early multiracial Jewish family who began their lives enslaved in the Caribbean and became some of the wealthiest Jews in New York. Laura. Thank you so much for having me on this panel. It's so exciting to see this resource. And I think it's such a great example of how digital humanities can allow us to see new connections across the Jewish worlds that existed at various eras. So I really, one of the things I was really struck by was that ability to see how Jewish traditions were changing over time, as well as how place was interacting with the variety of women's writing. So one thing, the America's part has a little bit yet to come, but I really was thinking very much as I was looking at the earlier parts about how it set the stage for what was going to happen in the Americas and both what was similar and what was different. So some of the really strong similarities that I think are just fascinating are the ways in which in spite of us having these kind of random little fragments of what ends up being preserved in any particular moment, I feel like there's so much arbitrariness for when any woman's document survives from the early time period. In spite of that, I could see this continuity of different genres that women were writing in other parts of the world in the Americas. So for example, the emphasis on songs and the emphasis on prayers and the emphasis on some early autobiographical fragments and above all letters. So I just feel like those sorts of that ability of this project to help us see how letters change over time really radically changes how we both can think about letters in our own eras and time periods, as well as what our students could do when they come to this resource. So for me, I kept on thinking like, oh, this is gonna be so exciting in the classroom that because of that keyword ability, students are gonna be able to go in and look to see what are the four mothers that my writer that I'm looking at didn't even know about, but to see those kinds of echoes across time. So that was super exciting to me. And then on the differences side too, that I was really struck by how for Jews in the Western Sephardic diaspora and in the early Americas, how the notion of what a Jewish language was, was so shaped by the Inquisition 
and by the access to different kinds of education and the ways in which Spanish and Portuguese, for example, end up being dragged along into the Americas as being really signposts of Jewish identity um, and Jewish distinctiveness within Jewish communities of what kind of Jew am I? So I was really excited about both how this was laying a groundwork for the time periods and cultures that fed the Americas, but also for how students were going to be able to take this project and really for themselves kind of do history, right? Be able to go and make connections that I might not have seen or that we might not have intended. And for me, that's always like the most exciting part in the classroom is when the students suddenly are able to do their own history making of creating narratives that weren't the ones that were just received from generation to generation. So thank you so much for creating this project. Thank you, Laura. Um, now we're going to bring all of the panelists back on the screen and we're going to have a conversation. Um, and Laura hinted at something that um, we haven't announced yet, which is that this is kind of a proof of concept. And we do plan to get uh, to expand this exhibit significantly. Right now it focuses on uh, the a particular part of the world, but we want to expand to other locations that Jews emigrated to immigrated to later. And uh, also, Laura hinted at the the importance of this exhibit for classroom use. And we were really thinking about that when we created the exhibit. We do hope that people will use this uh, not just in the university setting, but in educational settings at all for all ages. So I want to start by asking the panelists. Where can women's voices be found in the historical records? And what is the process for researching women's texts? And maybe we'll start this one with Federica. Um, um, thank you, Sarah. And uh, I, I, I will tell you briefly my experience. For me, what has been always interesting in looking, I work on um, Jewish women's history in, um, the, in the early modern period in um, Italian cities, port cities, in the, and in, in the in Mediterranean as well. And for me, what was very interesting is on the one hand also noticing that sometimes European scholars have the tendency to prefer um, um, sources in the vernacular or in Latin that are found in state archives, while Israeli and American scholars privilege more um, internal documents, um, prescriptive literature or um, philosophical works and writings in Hebrew and Yiddish as well. So for me, the, 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 the most interesting thing was bringing all the sources together when I, I write about Jewish women. And I would say that, and another thing that for me is important, I think that for all of us, because I, I know you, the work of my colleague here is also going beyond the, the famous women, uh, taking the famous women into, into account. Rene mentioned Donna Grazia or Glickel from Amel that are absolutely crucial, but also going to the daily life and the quotidian of Jewish women. So for me, for example, it's important looking at the prescriptive literature, for example, Book of Customs on Women, are important and you in, you question gender there and you find gender definitions. Then you look at the daily life of women and then here you can have a plethora of courses. So for me, the important thing is bringing these sources together. So looking at the, Inquis the Inquisition archives and then contextualize the, the um, the, uh, uh, prota the female protagonist of some trials, looking at notarial wills. And then notarial wills had often women, at least for the Italian peninsula, because the notarial culture was permeating the culture, um, uh, the society, I mean. And then you look also at uh, uh, dowries, you look at the inventories, and you look at writings of women and letters. So I think that the idea is starting from a document, but being sure to contextualize the document as much as you can. Thank you. Who else wants to address that one? Renee? Yeah, I have been um, very, um, paid a lot of attention to the whole idea you said voices, the voices of women, not necessarily the writings, but the voices of women. And starting, I started, I started with inquisition documents uh, and and in them there are confessions 
and the women are speaking. Um, we don't know if they were literate or not. It doesn't matter because even if you were, there was a notary who was writing everything down for everybody. Uh, and and if and in the in the occasions when there might even be torture, you can hear them screaming, "Ay, Dios mío!" I mean, they wrote down everything that that they said, and I heard literally heard the women's voices there. Uh, and then to move on, and I think that it was mentioned briefly, but but say in the the Geniza documents, um, I and and my colleague Odex Zinger, uh, we had a wonderful chavruta one year. Uh, and we both came to the conclusion that it really doesn't matter if these women could write. I'm pretty sure that my Maniu sister was literate. I am pretty sure, but she had a scribe write it because it wasn't acceptable to have something. If she, she turns to her brother and the opening line, which was not, not there, is she turns to him like he's the, his majesty. I mean, with all of the kavod, all the honors that, that you have to give to two or three lines before she even is her brother, for God's sake. But she's sitting there and she's giving him all the honor to make sure that he doesn't get offended by her and that she does everything correctly. And besides, the scribe there wouldn't let her start, hey, hey, bro, <laughs> with something like that. And you, so you, you hear, you know, it doesn't matter that they're, they're not writing it. On the other hand, we have, uh, it was mentioned briefly, I think that uh, Asnat Barazani, uh, whose, whose, uh, uh, whose documents are in Hatsi Kolmos, uh, which is a, a writing that's sort of along the idea of Rashi script, but a different kind. Uh, and, uh, and, and the material there that I had the honor of getting some letters that no one had seen and they found at the National Library. And because then I was known as the nut who was interested in Jewish women, uh, was given this microfilm and have a husband who can read the Chatsi uh, so that so that that we could hear her talking, not only writing letters to donors for her yeshiva, and 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 not only you know there she's saying talking about the fact that she doesn't have money and what happens and the and the trials and tribulation and there, and so there you I have an example of those are her words. She was writing. There's no there is no doubt no no doubt about it. Uh, you know, so that that it doesn't matter to me. It's it's wonderful. I'm I'm happier to have to see a, a woman's handwriting. I'm happier to see how she how how educated she was and how she was going to to, to express herself. Um, but but since <laughs> since I've been working for uh, the, the the Geniza material, I have to say it doesn't it doesn't matter as much because you can still hear their voices whether because they're, those women are sitting there and they are dictating the letters and they're having them read back to them. They're not just dictating and walking away. They are having read back to them. There are cross outs, there are corrections, there are, there are drafts, which we found. You know, and and it's, it's clear that this is, this is th their voice. And, and if they want to have someone else write it because they're not able to, because they're poor, uh, you had to have money to pay a scribe unless it's a family member. You know, there, so we'll say something about the socioeconomic level as well. Um, but I think that 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 using voices is so much more important than necessarily saying women women's writings. Uh, you know, because the, uh, we get in the modern period, of course, they're writing. But in the medieval period, besides you know a, the wife of Don Donash Don, Don ibn Rabrat, uh, and we don't know if that's her handwriting e either. That she sent the letter. We can sort of hope it is. Uh, you know, but I think that the, the, the voice is, is really, really a very important, essential thing to, to, to keep, not to lose uh, focus there. Can I jump in as well? Yes, Hila. I really love that point about how um, it's the voice that is carrying over time, regardless of medium. Um, and I feel that also in working with jewelry, um, texts, songs, um, and for me, what that research process looks like, I mean, does it, I mean, research, I suppose, is, is one word that could be used to describe it, but it's about getting to know people and it's about forming collectives. So, um, for example, my collaborator, Valeria Nakshun, and I work with other young people who speak English and who are learning Juhudi. Um, and in that process, we um, 
we work with teachers who are carrying through um, not only language, but also particular texts, particular motifs, genres over time. And so you get this interchange between the oral and the written that um, I think in some ways can mirror maybe this interchange between um, a woman and, and a scribe, um, even though it's of course quite different as well. So um, in the history of Juri in particular, um, you have a phenomenon where the um, emergence of the Soviet Union and the structures that the Soviet Union put in place. So again, we're talking about Azerbaijan, Dagestan, Chechnya, and kabardino balkaria for the most part, as well as um, a number of other regions as well, Shirvan, for example. Um, when you have the Soviet Union essentially uh, imposing alphabets, for example, um, dictating educational policies in a really complicated relationship with Juhuri, um, activists and educators, um, there's a process of a lot of oral things becoming written. And then you start seeing voices emerge that might have been easier to deny otherwise. So even in like the earliest Soviet collections of Juhudi folklore, you have the appendix at the end, you know, who told the story? It's very often a woman. Um, and then as you move forward, you have um, a process by which that interchange continues. Like today, um, Abby mentioned a collective of um, Juri language activists, predominantly women, who work together to make translations, um, to um, write their own poetry, and to um, make new versions of fables and, and stories. The collective is called Zuhunda Dei, or Mother Tongue. And in part because of all those imposed alphabets, um, the participants have a range of alphabets that they're comfortable with that are different from one another. And so the primary medium of communication is voice messages in WhatsApp. And that's something that's absolutely fantastic. You just get a, a vision of what it means to teach and learn languages that um, is very different from what you would see in a, a textbook for a classroom, for example. Thank you. Um, and Laura, your own research gets at this question um, from a slightly different perspective. Do you want to tell us about how you found out where to find women's voices in the historical record in the Americas? Yeah. So. I often work on women who didn't leave written records. And so I think part of uh, one of the strategies that I've used so has been to turn to objects that the women owned. And I do think there is some blurriness there, right? So sometimes the objects do have writing in them and are in our traditional sense of our written work. Um, particularly with a sense of like what we expect from authors and sort of solitary authors, but resonates with what a lot of people have already been saying on this panel. So to give a couple examples, one object that I've talked about is a series of cups of silver cups that were handed down through a family that were owned by a woman who was the niece of a silversmith. And she annotated the bottoms of them um, with information about like which child they should go to, as well as leaving a will where she indicated what, so she in some sense, like other people mentioned, like did have something that she had dictated to somebody um, in that sense, but she was rare. So some of the other women that I worked on um, would um, be creating objects which had no writing on them or in one case was a commonplace book where a lot of the friends who were coming to visit were writing things in her book or leaving artwork in her book. Um, so it was a little bit like Facebook for the 19th century or something like that. So I do think in that sense that the significance of that book becomes about building community, right? As opposed to being a solo um, artist in, a, in the sense that we normally think about authors um, during even that time period as being. So very different from um, Grace Aguilar, who's writing novels and whatnot during the same time period that we have women who are just sort of more everyday women also engaging in these sort of group writing activities. Um, another example that would be that I've been working on recently are album quilts where the women will get together in these sewing circles, Jewish sewing circles, and create quilts either for displays um, and for sale or for raising funds for a synagogue or for donation to men during the Civil War. And they'll often write little notes on them in indelible ink. Um, so we, we definitely also have this way in which the writing of messages on the fabrics is important, but also 
we know that when women got together in these sewing circles, there was often one woman who would sit there and read to the other people as they were writing, or that there would be conversations about larger topics. So it's a sort of precursor to salon. So I definitely am really interested in both the textual side of things, of what gets preserved, but also the ways in which women are writing their histories through other things that they own as well. Wow, that's amazing. And I guess if we think about the guest book as the Facebook of the 19th century, we could think of the Cairo Geniza as, well, not really the Facebook, but the internet of the medieval period, maybe, because um, it preserves so much and makes me think, you know, to, to what extent um, 600 years from now, people are going to take what we're doing and, and, and find their historical record um, using the Wayback Machine or whatever the equivalent is 600 years from now. Uh, but Renee, can you talk a little bit about the Cairo Geniza and its role in preserving not just women's voices, but quotidian voices? Um, okay, I, you have to understand that the Cairo Geniza was, was unique by chance. Uh, it was, you know, every, every community has a Geniza for uh, any, any material that has either Hebrew letters or the name of God in it. So that even if it's written in uh, a vernacular, but it has the name of God in it, it should, it should go into the Geniza. Uh, in, in, in Cairo, there were three synagogues and each of them had a Geniza. Um, but as it turns out, because of the nature of uh, where they put the Geniza when they rebuilt it, uh, and also due to the fact that very often you bury Geniza material uh, and there were attacks, there was a major attack uh, on a procession, a funeral procession, uh, that they decided it was getting too dangerous to schlep the Geniza materials there as well. Let's put it into this roof. They built this special roof uh, in, in, in the synagogue uh, that proved to be fabulous because well, it closed quite well and uh, things were preserved, they were dry and they had no intention of preserving the material. Uh, the, other, the other really important um, uh, characteristic there is that this was at least until 1204 when Maimonides dies, this was where the court uh, was that Maimonides presided over uh, and, and the head of the, he was the head of the Beit Din and the amount of response and the amount of questions that he got and he responded to uh, are uh, amazing. Uh, there are my colleague Mordechai Kiva Friedman just keeps going and going and going, finding material from him and then from his sons. So there's, there's a, a tremendous amount of material um, of all different kinds. In other words, there are, say, the earliest, the, 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 there are just um, uh, prayer books and that, that had to be tossed out. There are uh, other kinds of other holy books that, had, that were getting worn out and couldn't be used anymore and put in there. And for, um, there are so many Geniza scholars who work on non-quotidian, aspects of, of Cairo, of, of, of uh, Cairo. We're talking mostly from 950 to 1250. That's when most of the material is from. There are so many scholars that are working there. There are linguists, there are Talmudists because there are copies of, 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 of uh, tractates there and that nobody had seen or the earliest ones or Ben Sira, which was what Schechter uh, went you know, uh, crazy over when he, when he saw that in, in, in Cambridge. Uh, and so that there's, there's an awful lot of stuff that I think that in the beginning, this is what they were looking at more of what kind of books might, might have been put in there. Uh, it's much, much harder to work with the single pages that they are. I mean, Sarah, you would like to think it's internet is a problem. It's a one way street. Every time I teach about, I had a, an entire course about women in the Geniza. And every time I bring in a, in a document, they'd say, yeah, but what happened? And I say, we don't know because we because the response was, you know, that that that, that was the response was going out. Well, the, the letter was coming back. It was it was being put, it was being put somewhere else. Uh, and so that it's really, I mean, occasionally I actually you find sometimes um, the same scribe, or there's there was one, there's one teacher who was a scribe who um, one of um, uh, one of Goitein's doctoral students actually wrote his dissertation about him. And this was uh, a guy who, he was a miserable wretch 
and he married this, he, he, he actually, we have letters that he wrote to his aunt saying, you know, I want to marry your daughter. And she basically said, nothing doing. So we sort of have her letter, we, we, her, her response to him uh, and ends up marrying another family member who he treated terribly. And there were letters, you know, that, he, that she's, she's, she's going, gone into children depression. Uh, so that, that particular, in that family, because a lot of them were writing each other and because somehow you could put two and two together, it's one of the rare situations where you can actually suddenly have a, a fairly full story about, you know, about, about uh, what's going on in that, that specific group of uh, uh, that family. I and mean, he, he was also the nephew of the head of the Beit Din at the time. Um, but the, the, what then happened, and I think the biggest, um, well, Goitain was responsible for bringing this world uh, into, our, uh, into our consciousness. Because until then, everybody thought, uh, you know, the dark ages, medieval, the Jews suffered, et cetera, et cetera. And as a result, we discovered, he discovered, and he presented this amazing open society that was being treated very well by the Muslims being very tolerant uh, and uh, a mobile society, which is why we have so many letters. Because had they not been moving around, had they not been, un, you know, Goitain started with merchants. And we have letters, the merchants and, and writing, you know, please, uh, the famous one he has about writing to his wife, you know, I'm really sorry um, that it's taking me so long to come home, but I was robbed and, my, and the, 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 the ship sank and so on and so forth. So I have to make up the loans that I took. Uh, but uh, it's okay. I agree that you have put a uh, that you could put a, a get in the in the draw, and a, you can use it. You know, I'm sending you I'm sending you a divorce document. You can use it if I don't come back. But I really do care about you. I mean, so we get again one one side, but a pretty full picture of what's going on in the family. Or the father-in-law who writes his son-in-law, "You've been gone for 23 years, and we just found out you're still alive." You did, what about your children? What about your family? You know, and so on and so forth. If, if Goitain opened us to this world, he gets so much credit because he actually had in his six volume work an entire chapter about the world of women. Uh, he's a man whose mother was a strong woman. His wife was, I, I actually met him two years before he passed on and his wife was at his house, a uh, wonderful wife. He had he really cared about women and respected them and was thrilled and brought a ton of material. And it was, and, and then from after that, the, the fact that there, um, that, that there's a uh, digitization now of the, of the material that they're able to take both from JTS, from Cambridge, from Oxford, from, the Lenin, from Leningrad, from you know, all different places where people are willing to let them digitize it, it is, fabulous that you can go on and that I can sit in Jerusalem. I mean, I've been to Cambridge, but I can sit in Jerusalem and literally not only see this letter, but enlarge it, flip, flip it around, and you can you know, match scribes, handwriting, and so on and so forth. So that, that this is, I think it's the, the emphasis on letters. We were, became aware of this world through, uh, of the world of letters through Goitain. I mean, he did publish the letters of medieval trainer, traders, because he was interested in them. And, and then, you know, sort of moving on, the, um, quite a few of us have gotten really, really interest, interested in it. Uh, and it, 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 gives you, it gives you images of what's going on, um, at least from the perspective of whoever's sending that letter or who's replying, replying to a letter, uh, which is a lot more than we had before. Okay, well now, thank you. I'm, I'm adding Abby back into the conversation. And Abby, based on what we've been talking about so far, what can you tell us about things you've noticed in the exhibit? Uh, for example, like which languages have which types of documents? And, or, or uh, what, what, what have you, what, what do you want to add to the conversation so far? Yeah, well, Hila, you said something that was interesting on the, um, in the women's collective that people are writing in so many different alphabets. Um, and a lot of the time when we're classifying languages, it's really, it's kind of hard to do. And, and early on, Sarah, when you and I were talking, we were saying, we don't really want to like exclude languages because this is like not a Jewish language because they're Jewish women and they're writing about Jewish content. But we also do want to highlight those things. Um, and so sometimes when we say, uh, you know, Judeo, whatever, 
maybe what people were speaking was pretty much the exact same as their non-Jewish you know, neighbors, but the alphabet was different. They were using, uh, you were using Hebrew letters and there's Abby, totally Abby, different, yeah. I just want to tell you something. I've been doing, I, there's a, um, a Yemeni artist who is now uh, publishing something in Nashim about her experience with the languages in Syria. And in Syria, there were three kinds of Arabic. There was the Arabic of that the, Jew, the Jews spoke, that there was Arabic that the Christians spoke and the Arabic that the Muslims spoke. They understood each other, but there were three different dialects and they were all written in Arabic. They, not in, not, they didn't use Judeo-Arabic, they were writing in Arabic, but there were three different dialects. Right, so you end up like with that. So with you know, Neo-Aramaic, the Jewish dialects and the Christian dialects and the Muslim dialects are very different from each other, but also some of the Jewish dialects are totally different from each other. Um, and so, right, you can have things where people are all using the same writing systems, speaking distinct languages, or people are using totally different writing systems to write this different languages. You know, I'm sorry, use the same writing system. You know what I'm trying to get at. Um, and so to kind of like classify those things is very interesting. And uh, sometimes it's like, well, what do we, do we need to classify these um, in this way? So yeah, especially when we get into more of the modern stuff, um, we end up with uh, folks writing in more diverse um, writing systems, but some of the older stuff is too. And that's really cool. Um, something that Federica uh, had was a, set of wills um, from Venice and they're in, they're all written in Latin characters, but sometimes there's Italian, sometimes there's, you know, the Venetian dialect specifically, sometimes there's Ladino or Portuguese that shows up in them. Um, and people are kind of just writing all of that within one thing. So I think also to, yeah, to say that we're not, we're not so bounded sometimes either in genre or in language um, across, and uh, you know, even one, one document itself. Yeah, so I think this exhibit really highlights the multilingualism of Jews in any given place and time, and also the migration history and patterns of Jews that, um, you know, you mentioned Renee the Letters and the Cairo Geniza, but, but even th there are several documents there where we weren't sure where to put it on the map because it was created in Israel or in Los Angeles, but the person was from Iran or Yemen or whatever. And, uh, and, and so we, we really should have some of these items in the exhibit in multiple locations reflecting those migrations. And that's kind of what, what the platform was built to demonstrate. Uh, it's, it's a platform, I, I don't think we've said this yet, of the Jewish Music Research Center. And so a lot of the exhibits on there are about music um, and various uh, projects throughout uh, of within um, history, um, and I think this is the first one that focuses on language. Uh, so I want to open it up to other panelists to um, address anything that has come up so far, and then we'll turn to the audience Q and A. In terms of this question of location, um, that part of working with Abby and working with you all was particularly special because. Um, the ways in which language is recorded and carried forward is what allows it to transcend location in a way. Um, so like we've talked about this, this matter of um, the alphabets um, in which Djibouti is written, in which uh, any range of writing by Jews and, uh, and speaking by Jews happens. Um, we've talked about um, the mobility of, of people over space. Um, and what this looked like in part for, for Juhudi was a kind of double diaspora. So um, Juhudi is considered to be a diasporic language in its location in the Eastern Caucasus. That today you have um, communities in Palestine, and Israel, in Brooklyn, in Berlin, um, in Australia. So um, it's this phenomenon where the question of language advocacy relies really heavily on the fact that you had a medium of record. And so the way that the, the map um, plots that out. So like we had a discussion um, where like Abby, you and I were triangulating with Frida Yusufova about where she wanted her etymological dictionary placed um, since it's it's about relationships between words in Juhuri and words in Hebrew. Um, and, and it turned into this, you know, relay that really kind of, um, I think, 
uh, like represented or projected the, the way that it's it's the fact of mem like remembering these words and then in one location learning them in one location and putting them on paper in another location um, that like um, enables the language to survive and thrive. And I wonder, I mean, I wonder what that experience is like in um, a context uh, beyond the modern. Um, so for me, it's always about talking to people, you know, on WhatsApp through messages. And that is an atypical experience, I think. Um, so I wonder how um, this question of location and the complexity of where people were writing from looked like um, for all of you. I would like to jump in. Yeah, Federica. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for your remarks and your questions, because I think also that what this work that we do in different fields and this um, exhibit shows is also a kind of different interest that we have in, in compared to previous generations. So in, in, uh, I was just thinking about uh, an illustrious um, Jewish woman, a published author, Sarah Coppio Sulam, who was attacked, she was educated in Italian, Latin and Hebrew literature. She opened a salon in Venice. She was attacked because she refused to convert to Judaism. She wrote a wonderful manifesto against the priest and she published it in a Christian, a, a pub, with a Christian a publisher in attack against this uh, priest. So that was basically the quintessential Renaissance dream of Burkhardt and other here, women in the Jewish women in the Renaissance. But what I, would, I think that now, for example, um, we are of course fascinated and interested from a, a literature point of view, a history point of view, and usually. Jewish women from at least in the context of Europe, from middle and upper middle class, often received a better education. But what we see is, for example, some testaments I worked on or other sources where you see women actually were not educated in a classical way. They were, though, more citizens of the world than their householders. And for example, if, if, if you can see when they were, how they expressed their um, language of friendship and kinship, they were donating um, objects from Venice to Constantinople, to, from Venice to Safed, impoverished women who, though they were mixing their languages on the one hand, some words in Ladino, some words in Hebrew, some words in Italian or Venetian dialects or Portuguese, and believe me, it's a nightmare to understand all these languages. The worst is the Venetian dialect. But then also this idea of giving objects and shaping through the giving a new language and you see that these impoverished women from the Levant, as in, in some were women of color, a Jewish, they were or non Jewish, they converted to Judaism at a certain point, they were in any case positioned themselves as citizens in the, in the world. They knew where Constantinople was, the, uh, same for Jerusalem, and then shaping a new kind of language that 20 years ago, probably we, did, we didn't have, we would not have appreciated in this kind of cosmopolitan attitude that we have nowadays that actually tell us more about a universe of women and their languages. Laura? Yeah, I think one of the things that comes to mind for me is both how some of the themes migrate across the different documents that we're having. So when I was listening to Renee, I was thinking about there's a an, an early letter written to Aaron Lopez from a woman in Iberia saying, my husband's disappeared and I know he was trading with you and can you find him? Because she's worried about being left um, in this sort of limbo state for the rest of her life of not knowing what happened to her husband. So very similar to that kind of early letters about what it means to be people in movement, but also that there's some of the songs and poems that are recorded from women during the Inquisition in New Spain are ones that variants are found in the 20th century in Converso communities in Portugal. So you get this sort of radical continuity um, where we know the oral tradition continues, right? But this moment of it being sort of fossilized in an inquisition record of this incredibly tragic song of a woman being caught in a cell um, and being punished and yet later echoes of it by somebody who had there's no way they would have read that inquisition record right it's 
that that song continued to be passed down in the community that she had come to the Americas from in Portugal. So I just feel like this project has that ability for us to see how languages persist across places, but also experiences keep on coming back and echoing across time and place as well. Yeah, thanks. And I'm glad you mentioned songs because that is the topic of our next panel in two weeks. And I recommend that everyone register for that too. Uh, and But also it, it gets at something that we had a tough time with in this exhibit, because originally this was just supposed to be an exhibit of writings, but it became clear to us that songs are so central to how women record their voices for future generations. And so we decided to uh, made it, make it an exhibit of writing and songs. And I think that was the right decision. And, and um, it, it, it is really interesting. I, unfortunately, we don't have recordings of songs from before the 20th century because they didn't have technology. Um, but we do have some documents of songs that were written out in previous eras and, and continue to be performed in various communities. Uh, so I want to ask uh, some questions from the audience. We've, we've gotten a bunch of them and uh, audience, feel free to add your questions in the Q&A as well. Uh, I want to start with a question uh, Mindy asked about the woman who was running the yeshiva, Asanath Barzani. So can can someone explain a little bit about her history? She wants to know where, I, I, where I it was and, and, and who were the students and were um, were there girl were there female students uh, and how long did the yeshiva last and how was uh, Asanath received in the broader community? Well, first of all, I think that you can go to the Women's uh, Jewish Encyclopedia and go up to Asanath Barazani. I wrote the entry there for all the uh, information, um, but I will. So I'm not going to go into the all the details, but I'm just going to say that what we're talking about is a situation. Uh, in, in Kurdistan of Asnak Barazani's father was a Talmud Chacham. He had a yeshiva. He was a, a charismatic, amazing guy. Um, and he had no sons. Uh, and he had one very, very smart daughter and he taught her. And she said that she, that she literally studied on her father's uh, lap. Uh, and when he, when uh, he had, he had a yeshiva and um, he, he, gave his star pupil, he said, you, you can take it over when I pass on. She married his star pu pupil, uh, who's, who was Mizrahi. Uh, and, when, and while he was the head of yeshiva, he obviously didn't like teaching very much. She was sort of sitting and studying. And so Asnat, she started teaching them uh, and not like the, the maiden from Ludmere, not, she doesn't talk about hiding behind any curtain or anything. It's a male yeshiva. There are no women there except for Asnat Barazani, who was, a, the, was the rabbi there, who was re, highly, highly respected because she was asked to send her students to actually as far to, to uh, Iraq, to Baghdad. She sent her son to become uh, a head of yeshiva in Baghdad. Uh, and her training was amazing. And she had, we have, we actually have letters from her, from donors and from colleagues and the way that they treated her was, was phenomenal. So I, I really suggest that to look in the encyclopedia for all the details and all the, the we don't, we have approximate years, you know, 1570s, you know, but, uh, um, and um, uh, she, we do have some things, we know we, some of her writings were lost, um, but the, the, I think one of the, the piece that, that was given to me um, was was about uh, about about donors who sent her rather than sending her money they sent her etrogim for Sukkot and her assistants hid it from her uh, and they and she found out afterwards they said they wanted to get a better price it was some nonsense and she gave them hell and she wrote this long letter of apology um, but the other things that we have that were published beforehand are um, are letters that are in they are poetic incredibly high Hebrew uh, and, and, and really quite moving where she describes her situation and her, and her children's situation, her father and, and, and her family and whatnot. It's pretty, uh, bio, uh, uh, I'd say, biographic. Thank you. Uh, so Phyllis asks, what was the literacy rate among Jewish women in Europe in the Near East during the Middle Ages as compared to non-Jewish women? And I would also add compared to men. 
And so this is, I guess, a question for everyone. Let's start with uh, Federica. I, um, I also um, bring the early modern period in. Um, I would say that one, one thing I think we should remember also, and that it was not only for the Jewish world, but also for the, the Christian world, at least in, in, in Europe, is uh, there were, in any case, we shouldn't um, forget that we're reading and writing were two different training and were two different systems. So wh wh while we, we think about literacy in terms of writing and reading together, actually, Often reading and writing were different, and the, if we can see, if we can look at the majority of Jewish women, surely they were more like Christian women as well, and like also Christian and 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 Jewish men for some for to some extent, they were uh, more educated, first educated in reading and then in writing. Um, regarding the um, the difference in um, the, dif the difference in terms of um, literacy, right, between men and, and women and, and Jewish and Christian women. For my, now, I, 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 re, I really look at my context for the uh, medieval and early modern uh, the Italian peninsula that in any case was a, a cosmopolitan center because of various immigration waves. I would say that uh, um, there was a common uh, a char a characteristic of having Jewish women um, mm, educated to read and uh, to read, first of all, in any case, in um, they were educated in, he, in reading in Hebrew and Italian as well, that or in any case, it come up with their uh, uh, living and immersion in a uh, Jewish and non-Jewish society, despite the ghettoization, that was a problem. It was an issue, of course, but there is uh, this idea of uh, Re speaking in Italian and reading in Italian as well, and then having a basic education in Hebrew. I would say that this kind of sort of bilingualism was not uh, often shared by Christian women. On the other side, Christian women left. The, um, it's, it's also true that there is, a, a, if we look at the middle and the upper middle class Christian women in medieval and early modern period uh, in Europe, we see a more habit to write down um, um, so, um, memoirs, journals, etc., that uh, perhaps in the Jewish society was not uh, shared at the same level. These are the first reflections that come to, come, come to my mind. Renee? You, that, look, as, um, just a second, I have to refuse, okay. Um, in, in the, in the, I say that in the Geniza society, we do have women who are completely illiterate. They are getting instructions saying that uh, that there are instructions saying that they have to um, uh, have the letters read to them. So that's clear that they can that they cannot read. Uh, you know, uh, Frederica is absolutely right about reading and writing. I use the Yemenites as a perfect example because even up to the 20th century, every Yemenite male. Was was could read and could read in Rashi script and could read in you know Judeo Arabic and could read Hebrew and whatnot, um, but uh, many of them never had the need to write until some of them came to Israel and then they had to write them letters and I've seen the letters that were sent uh, and sometimes they wrote in Rashi script because they didn't realize that that's not how people don't write nowadays that you know the Hebrew. Um, I think also that in in Spain, from what I know. Um, the the women who are able to read are the wealthier from the wealthier families when they are private tutors uh, and the fathers are interested in investing in it. Uh, the women who are dealing uh, who are uh, money lenders are learning the vernacular because they've got to deal with the non Jews. Uh, it, it, you know, depending upon the trade. Uh, there are women are leaving. Uh, uh, we have women's wills uh, in, and but they're often going. They have women's wills that are sometimes both in in Latin, but they don't know the Latin. They are going to, to they are going to have it so that if anybody contests it, dina de machuta dina. The 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 language the the law of the land is the law, and so that if any, any Jew Jew contests it, that's going to be the final say. Uh, you know, so that again, having the knowledge to go and do something like that and having it written down um, doesn't mean, you know, that they're 
that they know how to do it, but they're smart enough to know what they need to, to, to protect themselves. I think that the, I think the literacy rate is quite low, even of, for, for women reading, they're not reading Hebrew on the whole. I mean, that's why the Do Not Shiv in the Bright's Wife is such a phenomenon because she really, you know, we have, we have, I know of, there are a few women who wrote, who had wrote Arabic poetry uh, earlier on, uh, but these, again, it's usually they're, they're in a family of poets. They're from a family of highly, high, highly educated fathers, brothers, whatever. Um, on the whole, from what I know from medieval Spain, uh, the women are there. There's not a lot of material to show. There's, there's, there aren't any signs to say, oh, look, she knows. It's, it's very frustrating. Um, but I suspect that many of them really, they definitely didn't write. And many of them also couldn't read you know, anything. They might have gone to synagogue and listened, uh, you know, just as in, in the Islamic lands, the women would, you know, do that as well. They would listen and they would know by heart because they would hear the prayers. Um, but they often didn't know, they often didn't even know what they were saying. Yeah, and this really gets, oh, Laura, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say um, something very similar for the Americas. I uh, really think of there as being a huge shifts starting in the 1830s to 40s where we've had women before that who had sort of dame schools with that were small secular schools but by the 1830s and 40s women are starting to take over education in the synagogues and for and for jewish run schools um, and and publishing pamphlets both in in uh, london as well as in the americas on how to do uh, how to teach children and very much a conversation between different newspapers of spreading that information about how women are in charge of schooling. And then I would say um, a similar sort of shift, uh, sort of an exponential shift happens in London in the 1880s um, when we start to have the great migration coming into London with the Jews free school expands radically and really changes the kind of education they're giving to poor Jews in the East End, such that they're able to educate an enormous mass of children and it becomes the largest Jewish school in Europe at that point. So really, um, really radically changing the nature of schooling and for the Jews free school, um, again, very much egalitarian in the sense of wanting girls to be educated and teaching girls Hebrew and whatnot, but um, also having a very material based education that was very different between girls and boys where boys were learning how to do things like shoot guns and girls were learning how to have this very elaborate um, sewing pedagogy and, and home care pedagogy and laundry pedagogy and all sorts of things. Sarah, just one quick comment because she was mentioned, you know, Abby calls her the nursing mother, but this is Miriam Batbenaya Hasofer came from a family of scribes. This was a family of her father, her grandfather, her great grandfather. And, and she also, she wrote hundreds of books. We know of this. We know because it was a traveler from Israel who went there and saw the collection of books that she wrote. And the reason that in, in this, she writes, she doesn't only, she doesn't, she writes, we have colophones that scribes would write in the beginning, you know, to give a little comment, a little something personal about, about what they did. And she, she's, she's apologizing. If I made a mistake, if I made a mistake, please forgive me because I'm nursing. Um, but she uses it with a biblical quote of, of the, of the sin that Aaron and Miriam in the, in the Bible that, if, that Aaron says about Miriam. So you see this extra layer of erudition. She's not just a scribe copying it, but she's using it when I, when it hit me what she was doing, you know, I just like, I had this eureka moment of, oh my God, Miriam, not, I mean, she was, she was identifying with Miriam and Aaron from the Bible and talking about the whole, you know, about her, uh, about the sin that, that her imaginary sin versus uh, Miriam and her leprosy. Wow. I love that. Uh, and we're, we're talking here about discontinuity with the past between the past and the, the modern period. Uh, and that that would be a great topic for another panel someday about to what extent contemporary Jews use language in ways that are similar to and different from Jews in the past. And um, obviously the, the literacy practices and the gender dynamics 
play a big role in, in that conversation. But um, I wanna turn to another question from the audience and we're, we're running low on time. So I don't know if we'll get to everyone, but um, Mika asks if some of the uh, evidence of minority Jewish dialects have attracted the interest of scholars of more dominant languages like Persian or Turkish, or has, the, has it remained the interest of Jewish studies scholars alone? So I wanna turn that first to Hila about Juhuri. Do you know if there are non-Jewish uh, scholars and especially when we're thinking about uh, language but also literature who, who have uh, researched Juhuri? Absolutely. Um, there's Murad Suleimanov, Gilles Autier, Habib Bourjan. So Murad Suleimanov is a linguist um, who um, has studied the Muslim taught uh, language and also Juhuri. Um, Gilles Autier is a French linguist. Habib Bourjan is a scholar of Persian languages, also a linguist. And you, you notice that among contemporary um, scholars of, of Juhuri who are coming from a kind of institutionalized academic uh, point, um, most people are united by their discipline. So that's, I think, the, the bound or restriction that there are a lot of people working on the linguistics of, of Juhuri in an academic setting. When you look into the scholarship and heritage work that's happening within Juhuri communities, it's, of course, uh, you know, focus on um, telling one's own history, the history of one's community and family, and um, that is difficult to categorize as Jewish studies or Persian studies or anything of that nature. It's something very special and particular. Um, in terms of working in uh, history and, and in literature, there are, um, well, I mean, there, there's some historical scholarship that's happening um, in Russian um, and in Turkish, Azerbaijani as well. Uh, in terms of literary scholarship, um, things are, are difficult. I mean, on one hand, literary advocacy and literary scholarship in a community sense is um, a huge and um, and, and marvelous uh, area in terms of how academic institutions have facilitated that or not. Um, there are two prominent um, historians of Juhuri literature, Galina Musakhanova and Mikhail Zad, whose focus was more on Persian languages, both of whom passed away um, within the last 10, 15 years. So um, that's been uh, interesting for, for someone just starting out working in literary scholarship. And, and then um, on one hand, it's, uh, it's a restriction and something that should change. On the other hand, it means that um, community scholarship is central. It is the, 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 the core of what's happening um, with regards to um, new, new research. So it turns out that the bounds of, you know, uh, Persian studies, Turkic studies, um, Jewish studies aren't really the bounds that matter. Um, it's really about what, what um, stories Jewish advocates want to tell about their own histories. Nice. And I think that applies to the study of Jewish languages as well. The boundaries of what is a Jewish language and not a Jewish language are not really important. What's important is uh, that we study the ways that, that Jews have spoken and written throughout history. Um, well, thank you. We are uh, coming to an end of this uh, wonderful panel. And uh, I, I don't, I'm sorry, we can't get to all of, of the questions. But I want to turn it over for the last few minutes to Hannah Pressman, the uh, Jewish Language Project's Director of Education and Engagement, to tell us a little bit more about the Jewish Language Project and um, to, uh, to take us out. Thank you, Hannah. <laughs> um, thank you so much. On behalf of the HECJR Jewish Language Project, I'd like to thank everyone in the audience for attending today's event, launching our new online exhibit, A Millennium of Jewish Women's Voices. This exhibit and surrounding events were funded by a generous grant from HECJR in honor of the 50th anniversary of Rabbi Sally Prezan's ordination. We'd also like to thank our many co-sponsors for their support. Cambridge University Library Geniza Research Unit, Jewish Arts Collaborative, Jewish Music Institute, Jewish Music Research Center, Jimena, Jewish Women's Archive, Lilith Magazine, Lowell Milken Center for Music of American Jewish Experience at the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music, Mother Tongue, Oxford School of Rare Jewish Languages at the Oxford Center for Hebrew and Jewish Studies, 
Posen Library of Jewish Culture and Civilization, Strom Center for Jewish Studies at the University of Washington, and UC Berkeley Magnus Museum. Lastly, thank you again to all of our panelists for being with us today and for your valuable contributions to this field of study. Part of the Jewish Language Project's core mission is to regularly convene experts across disciplines, as well as speakers and heritage learners to share their findings and thereby raise awareness of Jewish languages, both their rich history and their current precariousness. We provide these programs to the public free of charge so that all can come and learn. The Jewish Language Project is a nonprofit organization and we rely on donor support to keep our initiatives going. This is critical, time-sensitive work in the field of language preservation. Our current documentation project is on Iranian Jewish languages, which are among the world's most endangered. We've recorded about two dozen videos of interviews and songs, and our skilled staff members are now transcribing and translating the material. You can help us advance this important work and make these unique resources available by donating to our fundraiser. And Sarah's gonna drop the link in the chat. You can also reach the fundraiser by clicking on the donate or volunteer button on our homepage. Thank you for joining our mission to preserve our precious linguistic heritage. Today's event is the first of two launch events for the Jewish Women's Voices exhibit. Please join us on Zoom in two weeks, Sunday, November 13th, for a panel entitled Living Traditions, Women's Songs in Endangered Jewish Languages. That panel will be moderated by Dr. Vanessa Paloma Elbaz of Cambridge University, and it will include performances as well as conversation. One more exciting new program that I'd like to mention is a 12 week course on endangered Jewish languages. We're presenting this very special opportunity with Judaism Unbound and Anyashiva and we've got some of the world's foremost linguists teaching about these languages. The course starts February 5th and runs through the end of April. Registration will be opening up soon, so please check our events page for all the details. There are lots of ways to plug into what's going on at the Jewish Language Project. Our website, jewishlanguages.org, has several exhibits and language resources like the Jewish English Lexicon, so check it out. If you're not already following us on social media, you can find the Jewish Language Project on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We post fun facts twice a week, as well as the latest news related to Jewish languages. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel to check out videos of past events, songs, interviews, and more. And as of this fall, we've got merch. Check out our Redbubble shop for all kinds of fun items like mugs, aprons, stickers, dog bowls, puzzles, posters, and more all proceeds from merch support our initiatives. The very best way to keep up with all of our activities is to subscribe to our email list for occasional updates about events, programming, and research. Here at the Jewish Language Project, we believe that there is a world of history in every Jewish language, and each speaker has something to teach us. Thank you again for joining us for today's program. Take care, and we hope to see you soon.